Welcome to another episode of The Breakdown. There's been a lot, of, a lot of evolution going on in Canada. The country has evolved, media has evolved, and politics definitely has, I don't know if evolved is the right word in some cases, mutated might be another one, but we're going to try to get some perspective from a voice in Canada that has been a grounding voice for an extremely long time. Uh, we are so excited to welcome to the show for a very, to me, it's a very special conversation today. Uh, we're so excited to welcome to the show none other than Mr. Charles Adler. Mr. Adler, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so before we get into the, the 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 nuts and bolts of what's going on with media, what's going on with politics, if you wouldn't mind, I mean, I, I've been following you for quite some time so i i could probably do your bio but i don't think i would do it justice so if you wouldn't mind explaining a little bit about who is charles adler so who's charles adler i was born in uh, hungary uh, august uh, 25th 1954 uh that was 10 years after the uh, worst year in the experience of hungary in general and hungarian jews specifically 1944 is when uh, the Germans got highly involved in rounding up as many Jews as possible in Hungary and getting rid of them as much as much much sooner than uh, was expected for many other people who were involved in the Holocaust. And by that, I don't mean to be overly grim, and I certainly don't mean to uh, be glib. Uh, it's just that uh, in general, uh, many Jews who were captured uh, by uh, the Germans and other authorities went to a concentration camp and were there for a while uh, before they were put to death unless they were infirmed, unless they were mentally uh, infirmed, physically infirmed, or children, they got uh, dispatched immediately. But if they were useful uh, to the German Empire, uh, then they were worked to death before they were put to death. In the case of uh, my uh, paternal grandparents, uh, cousins, uh, and, and all kinds of other members of the extended family who I'd just as soon uh, uh, not not talk about because I think people get a little uh, a little um, uh, a little despondent when you tell them that uh, there are hundreds of people involved in, in my extended family alone. So I'll just stay with the, the nuclear family. So as far as my dad's nuclear family, we're talking about siblings um, and paternal uh, parents. Uh, they were taken to Auschwitz and dispatched almost immediately. Now. One can ask the question: Is that is that a is that is that a positive? It is a positive in my mind that they weren't uh, worked to death uh, for um, six months and a year and two years and and totally emaciated. Um, it happened relatively quickly. The reason it was done that way is because the war was basically over. The Germans at that point knew that they had uh, lost the war, and so they were just trying to uh, murder as many Jews as possible and Hungary was one of the last countries where they were doing this. So my, uh, my father was able to avoid the gas chamber because as crazy as this may sound, even though he was a Jew, he was in the Hungarian military, which was associated with the German military. They were, they were allied. And that doesn't mean that my father was able to have all of the same privileges or benefits, if you can call them that, of the average non-Jewish soldier. Uh, he was, uh, they, they was, they made sure that he wasn't able to have a weapon or weapons training. He basically worked in the in the kitchen. And when he got his honorable discharge, in one hand, he got a, a discharge, thank you very much uh, for, for serving in the, your country's uh, army. And on the other hand, he got uh, papers, uh, the papers that are uh, dreaded by, by people around the world. They're basically your death warrant show up at a particular train station uh, to get on a one-way uh, trip uh, to Auschwitz. So a friend of my dad, who happened to be a, a, a Gentile, a non, non-Jew, non someone who is referred to by many members of the Jewish community over the years as a righteous Gentile, like, a, like an Oscar Schindler, uh, he said to my father, uh, you cannot show up at the train station. You know what that's all about. And my father was obedient. He was obedient in his family. He was obedient uh, in the Hungarian military. Uh, my my father was going to do what the authorities told him to do. Fortunately for him, he had a righteous Gentile friend who told my father that he was full, full of crap, that it was his duty uh, to uh, do what he could to avoid the train. 
So this friend took him across the border. It wasn't too terribly far because he lived very, very close to the Romanian border. So he took my father across the border, and my father got some work uh, doing doing farm labor for just a, a few months. And after a few months of that, the uh, Russians or Soviets, as they were called, were coming through to do their so-called liberation of uh, Eastern Europe, which went all the way, of course, from the Soviet Union all the way to uh, to Germany. So it passed through Hungary. They were uh, fighting remnants of the, the Nazi regime in, in Hungary. And in doing so, uh, and you, you see this the situation with a lot of wars, they pick up everybody who is of military age in that country on the assumption that if you're in that country and you're of military age, uh, you're an enemy combatant, as we say now. So my father, of course, wasn't an enemy to anybody, but on paper to the Soviets, my father actually was. So he got picked up and turned into a prisoner of war. He didn't get on a train for Auschwitz. This was the Soviet Union. So he got on a train for Siberia. And he spent not uh, the remainder of the war there because the war was over in just a few months. Uh, he spent three years in Siberia. Yes, the Soviets uh, violated a lot of rules. They did then, they do now. And they kept him there. And uh, that is a very, very important part of the the peace for my family, that it wasn't uh, just fascism, it was also communism. So if we take that to, you know, where I, I stand today on issues, authoritarianism is not my cup of tea, whether it's uh, left or right. Uh, people on the, on the left have, you know, called me far right, and people on the far right have called me far left. None of these people have a an effing clue uh, about me and, and, and how I how I process things. And when people say that I've made major changes, I've not changed anything substantively. I've always supported those people who are best for democracy, because it is democracy that is the bulwark against the extremes. And so when I see any party, whether it's the Liberal Party, NDP, the Conservatives, start tilting uh, to, toward the, the nut jobs. I don't care whether they're right wing nut jobs or left wing nut jobs. I tend to. Um, I tend to push back. Fair enough. When did you make the decision to go into uh, into media? I mean, you started in, in radio, if I'm not mistaken. Um, when did you what what made you go? You know what? Radio. That's that's the thing I want to do. Well, the radio decision was the easiest decision in the world because, um, as you can imagine, I'd, I've, I've only talked about my father's side of the family. There's a story on my mother's side as well. She was nine years old uh, when um, the Nazis uh, knocked on their door and um, took her and her mother to uh, what I call uh, places the devil won't go. So suffice to say that uh, her mother was taken to a concentration camp. Uh, she was uh, taken to a different part of Budapest uh, it became the Hungarian Jewish ghetto. Um, there are several stories uh, around that that I could tell, depending on where we're going with this conversation. But the point is, both my father and the mother were, to say the least, traumatized. And uh, that trauma never went away. It's, uh, you know, today we've got a fancy term for it, a PTSD. Uh, that wasn't uh, the term that uh, was used back then. There were a lot of other terms, uh, none of them kind, but uh, let's uh, put it this way. Uh, a line from my father uh, from many years ago uh, haunts me to this day. Uh, he said that uh, Hitler wasn't able to kill him. Hitler wasn't able to murder him or my mother, but he stole their smiles. Uh, so um, it didn't matter how good things were at times in terms of uh, enjoying certain events, holiday events, things could could turn uh, very, very quickly for no no reason at all. Uh, their emotions were not what I would call uh, predictable or reliable. So there I am, a child uh, growing up uh, under the roof of, of people who, who love me to bits, but sometimes just aren't appropriate uh, to life because of the, the trauma that they're, they're suffering. And so the place I turned as a young child was my transistor radio. That's what gave me peace. That's what gave me emotional reliability. It gave me a certainty. I had my little earphones, not too different from, from these, uh, and they were inside that uh, transistor radio uh, virtually all day. I even took it with me to school. It was my uh, it was my security blanket. 
I listen to radio all the time. And uh, as you can imagine, I've never had a good night's uh, of sleep. I rarely sleep more than uh, one or two hours. Um, then I wake up for a while. I try to get back to sleep. But in, in total, on any given night, uh, ever since I was a child, it's not, not much more than uh, three or four hours. So the radio is on uh, all the time. And that uh, is still still the case. Uh, might not be radio. It might be a you know. It might be a podcast. It might be uh, Spotify. It d- doesn't matter. There's always some sort of sound uh, coming out of uh, some sort of receiver that I've got, and that uh, that has always been the case. So it was a natural for me. Uh, I uh, wanted to be the person on the radio. Uh, the person on the radio, in some ways, uh, was parenting me, and I wanted to become a parent. I wanted to be. You know, I, I don't have to. I don't think I explain this, except maybe I should, because uh, uh, I'm not a 25-year-old uh, person. I'm a little bit older than that. Uh, today, it's normal to hear a lot of female voices. It was not uh, when I was a child. Uh, you heard some female voices in the commercials, but all of the newscasts, uh, all of the DJs, all of the talk show hosts, everyone was male. And uh, I uh, thought I would become, if I was lucky, uh, one of the, those men. I ran away to the circus uh, quite early. I uh, stole the family vehicle when I was 16, driving all over Ontario, trying to find work. Uh, I could not find it. And uh, one day I asked a particular manager, why is it that I cannot find a job? I've got a tape. Um, I, a friend of mine at university allowed me into the radio station there and make a tape. I, I know the tape sounds as good as, as what you've got on the air at these uh, small towns in Cornwall and, and Brockville and a whole bunch of others. And this manager, uh, station manager and Smith Falls, Ontario, which is about an hour from Ottawa. So the reason you're not getting hired, kid, is because you're in the wrong market. You've got to apply in the major market. I realize they won't hire you in the major market because you've got no experience and you look like you're 12 years old. But that's just um, the way it shakes out. Find a job, uh, being a, doing something technical, be a gopher, be in the mailroom. We had mailrooms back then. Do anything you can in a big city, any city, Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, doesn't matter. Get your ass to a big city because nobody in a small town will hire you because once you're on the air as a professional, a big city will pick you up and that will make everyone around you feel like crap. We've got people at the station who've been here for five years, 10 years, they're going to be here for life. It'll make them feel like crap if someone who looks barely old enough to shave walks in and two months later gets picked up in in Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, Ottawa. So that was the, uh, that's the Coles Notes version of that particular story. I ran away to, to radio uh, quite early. Finally, 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 when I was 18, I had just turned adult. I got a job at my hometown, radio station hometown being uh, Montreal, which is where we landed after uh, the Hungarian Revolution. We were political refugees, so we landed in Montreal when I was uh, two years old. And so Montreal was effectively my 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 hometown. And uh, at 18, I got a job in my hometown as a uh, we just called ourselves board operators back then, now known as a technical producer. And then uh, six months later, I got my first job, uh, which was in uh, Calgary. And uh, that is where I absolutely fell in love with Alberta. Uh, thankfully, I'm wearing my glasses, so you cannot see the, the tears in the eyes. I get rather emotional at times. And I get really, really, really emotional when I'm Alberta bound. I've got that uh, song on my brain all the time, especially uh, today, um, just after uh, the passing of my friend uh, Gordon Lightfoot. I fell in love with Alberta. How could I not? Uh, the moment I turned on that professional mic uh, above that bookstore on 16th Avenue or Southwest and uh, told people that I was new, I was here from Montreal. There was no none of that, um, you know, stereotypical uh, reactionary attitude, which sometimes is called a redneck attitude. Uh, I've never met people with, with bigger hearts and everyone phoned in and uh, welcomed me uh, to Calgary, welcomed me to Alberta and uh, made me feel more at home. I can tell you that I felt more at home in Alberta after five days than I had felt in in Montreal in the uh, 18 years that I had lived there. Uh, I'm not trying to bash the East or bash my my hometown. Uh, I guess what I am trying to say is for those people who still contact me, uh, especially uh, the Take Back Alberta types that contact me in many different ways, telling me to keep my nose out of Alberta's business and what the hell do I know about Alberta? Here's what I know about Alberta. I love Alberta. I love Alberta. 
I want to go back for just a second because you piqued my curiosity through part of that story there. Um, when you were a kid and you were listening to the radio, I'm curious what sticks out that you were listening to. Well, uh, I listened to a fellow named Paul Harvey, and I don't know if that name means anything to you, but he was uh, quite an inspiring uh, broadcaster. He had three broadcasts a day. He did the uh, 8.30 in the morning news, and then he did the noon hour news, which was a lot longer. It was about 10 minutes. And then he did a feature called The Rest of the Story. And The Rest of the Story, it was a a story. It was always a story with a, a surprise ending. He was a tremendous writer, just a fantastic communicator. And as far as this child is concerned, he was Uncle Uncle Paul. So I listened to Paul Harvey. Uh, I listened to uh, music. I listened to all kinds of music. For whatever reason, the music that appealed to me most uh, throughout my life was country music. Country music also had stories, uh, whether they were sad stories or happy stories. Uh, they were they were stories of people who were not anything like the people in my life, because that is the story of my life. The story of my life is whether it had to do with various religions, whether it had to do with um, uh, various uh, cultural communities, uh, it was important for my child's mind to find avenues that were very, very, very far from where I was living. Uh, mentally, where I was living was was incredibly difficult. So escape was important. Uh, so whether it was uh, radio, TV, the movies, the music, um, escaping into these other platforms, these venues, whatever we like to call them now, I just looked at them as story time. I needed a, I needed a better story than the story that I was living uh, with my, um, my folks. In your career, I'm wondering, are there any particularly high watermarks that, that sort of, and I got to be clear, when I say in your career, it, I don't I don't think anybody who's been paying any sort of attention to what Charles Adler is up to. I mean, you're ostensibly retired, but not really. Um, (laughs) They can't they can't retire me. The mind, the mind. I I wish they could. You know, my mind refuses uh, to relax Uh, daytime, nighttime, uh, Saturdays, Sundays, holidays. It doesn't matter. So um, the the mind is not retired. And I I I managed to. um, you know, uh, people are always offering me d- different projects, and every now and then I, I, uh, I take one on. I'm taking one on right now with you, and enjoying <laughs> it a great deal. Well, thank you. Uh, and you you make regular appearances on Ryan Jesperson shows as as well, and you normally uh, sometimes you get a little fiery on there. But I'm wondering, are there any particular high watermarks of your career that, when you kind of look back at everything? Um, and as I say, look back, I am, of course, looking directly over your left hand shoulder. Um, but when you look back at everything, is there anything in particular that sticks out? Well, you know, you, I think you, you, you might be getting a glimpse of, of the Emmy. And uh, that was um, an amazing piece of work. A lot of people worked very, very hard on on making sure that uh, we qualified uh, for the Emmy. And it was, uh, uh, you know, best host in New England. And that was a, a really big deal because here I am a a Canadian kid. I'd only been in the States for a couple of years and I'm up against all these institutions, but we put together um, a heck of a show. Uh, the feature in that show that was kind of a high watermark for my career uh, was called Chuck in the truck in which I'm literally driving a truck. It was uh, uh, an F two fifty. It was a great big honking truck. It was uh, not anything an environmentalist would be proud of. Uh, I don't know whether we got, you know, eight eight kilometers to the gallon or whatever it was. We had two two gas tanks which we constantly had to had to fill, and we would drive all over New England. And I would get out of the truck. And of course, I'd have a camera person with me. Uh, his name was Russ, and Russ would uh, shoot uh, yours truly talking to people, regular people, about uh, things that made me curious about the news and certain news stories. Some of them were local, some of them were national, some of them were international. And so I would have these uh, conversations with folks and he would shoot the conversation. Then I'd get back in the truck and I would reflect, I'd just reflect, um, you know, he'd shoot me from the side. You'd see me driving the truck and I'd be reflecting on what I had uh, just seen, what I had heard. And uh, then he put uh, a five minute montage uh, together 
So you got clips of me talking to people and clips of me reflecting and uh, trying to describe it. You know, if I just had the the visual, people would understand, but I'm trying to do my best to uh, give you an audio version of, of, of what went on. Uh, it was very personal. It was um, very intimate. It had a lot of what I would call radio attached to it. Um, it was very much like any conversation that I would have with you or anyone else. Uh, it never failed to integrate my personality, my opinions. It was one said in, in Toronto by someone who wanted to uh, put me in the newsroom and have me read the 8 a.m. news. It was a top news executive who said, Charles Adler will never read the 8 a.m. news on this radio station in Toronto because Charles Adler cannot even clear his throat without offering an opinion that is going to tick off a lot of people. So I, I wasn't a news reader, and uh, I was just offering my running commentary on what was going on in the world, specifically focused on what we had just seen on that day. So that feature became Chuck in the Truck, and we did many other things on that particular uh, talk show called Adler Online. But I'll always be convinced that it's Russ and yours truly and some of the other good people working on that Chuck in the Truck feature that... Um, that got us the Emmy and um, it ain't bragging if you can do it. And uh, I'd be a liar if I didn't tell you that I was proud of it. Yes. I've gotten Canadian awards as well. Canada is uh, my promised land. My family's promised land. Uh, am I somewhat pro American? Do I, uh, am I grateful to the American opportunities I've had and American people I've worked with? Absolutely. Uh, but I am a Canadian. That's what my passport says. And uh, Canada is, is for my family, uh, the, the, the place that, and this I think takes us to some of the other places we want to go in the conversation, but as far as my family is concerned, Canada is the safest for them, the safest liberal democracy. And so when we talk about some of the things that are going on right now, I do think that some of the people who are pushing us toward a little more authoritarianism would never be doing that if they had walked even... 10 steps in my parents' shoes. And I'm not trying to put my parents above them. I'm simply saying that their experience and the experience of many, many generations, especially recent generations of Canadians, they do understand that this country isn't broke. They came from countries that were. And this is a country that has problems. All countries have problems. But when the Conservative Party of Canada or a Take Back Alberta or any of these various right-wing organizations when they want to lead with this country's broke, the reason they have a problem getting a diverse crowd is the diverse crowd feels that that's the kind of garbage that went on in the countries that did break, the countries they fled. The country I fled was broke. It was broke several times. It was broke by communists. It was broke by, by fascists. They broke the damn thing over and over again. My parents didn't come to Canada because they didn't speak Hungarian well, didn't fit into the Hungarian culture. My 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 mother, much like yours truly, because that's who I inherited from, my mother could go on for, for hours reciting poetry and telling stories, regaling the audience, and yes, even make them, make them laugh. Um, she didn't come to Canada because Hungary was together, because Hungary was in good shape. And she loved Hungary. She loved the Hungarian culture. That's where she's from. She came because she felt she had no choice. Her number one reason for putting me in my father's backpack to get me the hell out of that, that, that communist shithole was she feared for my safety. She saw children the same age as me being disappeared just 10 years earlier. As far as she was concerned, this was an opportunity in 1956, 57 that came up. There was just a little bit of a window of opportunity uh, for us to get out, and uh, she uh, convinced my father that we should take the risk of trying to get out of Hungary and take the risk of coming to Canada, where a liberal democracy would ensure that knock in the night that she heard when she was nine years old would never happen to her child when he was seven or eight or nine. But I've got to tell you, there's always another, on the other hand, portion of all of these stories. On the other hand, because of what she went through, she told me when I was very, very young, five, six, seven, very, very young, uh, to make sure that I knew as much as needed to survive on my own. 
uh, to not be childish, to make sure that I was engaged with adults at all times, because any time that knock in the night could come and your mother and or father could disappear and you'd better be able to survive on your own. So that was the, the message that this child had on the brain at all times. And that was another reason why radio was important for me. That was the bridge to the adult world, the, the real world as I saw it. One of the, I'm just going to be direct. One of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation with you is because of your history, because of your family's history. And part part of the big motivator for for having this conversation is it seems like there is a growing disconnect between the what I'll subjectively call the truth of history and the what people believe they see going on in the world around them. We saw, you know, it's it's listening to you speak for the last 20 minutes and juxtaposing that with some of the, the freedom rallies and such that we've seen over the last couple of years. And it, it couldn't be more far apart. Why do you think that we've seen this this disconnect? Why do you think people aren't... We have people like you that, that, that tell your stories and they're, they're real, they're rooted in history and they speak to the, the gravity of the situation and the severity of the potential consequences of ignoring these, I don't want to minimize it by saying cautionary tales, but um, that's what I'll go with. I hope it's not offensive. Um, why, why do you think it is that people aren't getting it? Well, I think uh, our institutions are crumbling. You know, whether they're religious institutions or secular. I mean, um, in most most cities and towns in the Canada I grew up in, people joined the service clubs, you know, Lions, Rotary, Columbus. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, everybody was involved in the community in some way. Now people are alone. You've got the U.S. Surgeon General this week saying that we've got a loneliness epidemic. Some people don't like that term. But it doesn't matter whether they like it or not. Loneliness is a very, very big deal. Social isolation is a very big deal. The vaccine, uh, the anti-vax uh, people will say, well, uh, this is all about Trudeau and it's all about the uh, pandemic and it's all about mandates and lockdowns and what have you. But of course, that's baloney. Uh, that made it worse for some people, no doubt. I'm not minimizing it. But this has been going on for some time. People are not as connected to their communities as they once were. And I always say to people who are going through a real rough patch, uh, you know, what do I do, Chuck? What do I do? And I always tell them, uh, you know, what was told to me when I was very young by people who did have it together. Go help somebody. Go serve somebody. Be part of something larger than you. Do some work in the community. Do some volunteer work. I don't, I don't really care what you do. If you're of service to somebody, if your mind is on getting somebody from A to B, your mind won't be on trashing the country, trashing the province, trashing the the police force, uh, you know, wh wh whatever whatever it is that people get their heads into when they're spending all their time online alone communicating with nut jobs. And I have to call them what they are. Nut jobs is the is the most polite uh, term I can find. I mean, it's it's not like I don't know they're nuts. They try contacting me all the time. They show me stuff that's a lot uglier than what they generally put on, on the web. And they believe this stuff. And th the fact that they're sincere about it doesn't make a damn bit of difference. They've been twisted. Some people use the word radicalized. We've got people in this country and the United States and elsewhere who have been radicalized on the web. And most of that stems from the fact that they're disconnected from what I would call traditional institutions. I mean, I use those service clubs as, as an example, uh, the religious institutions, it doesn't matter to me, church, mosque, temple, synagogue, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I'm not a particularly religious person, but I'm religious about the idea of you have to have a purpose in your life. You have to have, you have to believe in something that is larger in your, than yourself. And you have to, you have to serve somebody. You've got to, you've also got to find a mentor and you've got to walk in the footsteps of that mentor because that is how you can get through life with a feeling of satisfaction. You know, I don't want to get into religion too deeply here, but I'll, I'll just say this because 
I'm, I'm living in a country uh, where most people, okay, most people are either religiously Christian or nominally Christian. I mean, this this country got Christianized a long time ago. And the Christian faith, and it was a great teacher. I may not be a, a Christian, but nobody's going to stop me from admiring uh, one of the greatest teachers who ever lived, and that would be Jesus Christ. And so if you're walking that path, uh, if you're Jewish, if you're, you're walking in the path of, of the Jewish heroes, Muslim, the Muslim heroes, it doesn't matter to me. If you're walking in the path of, walking the walk and walking the talk of whoever that person is, that is someone that you know has a moral compass, someone who you know believes in right and wrong, someone who you know can guide you, find that person alive or dead. And unfortunately, the people who have become radicalized have been finding some very twisted people, and uh, and 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 that is why, uh, you know, you've you've got a situation now where these people are twisted, radicalized, whatever you want to call it, and they just don't believe anything that is coming from the likes of you and me. As far as they're concerned, you and I are part of some WEF conspiracy or, or whatever. Uh, like all cults, uh, people inside the cult are told to trust absolutely no one else. And, of course, it gets to the point of paranoia, and that's where things get really dangerous. The, the, the people who have been radicalized actually think that we're out to get them, and the pandemic gave them a, uh, a great cause in the pandemic with the so-called lockdowns we never had a the, the kind of lockdowns they had in australia and other countries but we we all know what what what, what they mean by their lockdowns uh with with that situation happening and the government uh encouraging people and sometimes encouraging them by telling them they, they couldn't they couldn't work um they couldn't socialize uh they, they felt like pariahs if they didn't follow public health rules masking vax and vaccinations we know all of this um those people honestly I'll never say that it was dishonest. Some of the leaders may have been dishonest, but many, many thousands of people in this country got absolutely caught up in this idea that they were being ostracized and persecuted. Some of these people even put on the yellow star. You can just imagine how hideous that is uh, to, to someone like me, a child of survivors. But I never, I never had trouble understanding where that came from. And I'll tell you this, um, the moment we lose all empathy for people, even the people we despise, we don't despise them, I don't despise them, I despise their cause, but the moment we lose all empathy for them, we lose the ability to build any kind of bridge. And unfortunately, that's the state of Canada right now. Uh, we uh, Silos is what it's often called. We, we, talk, we talk to People inside our, our echo chambers, it's sometimes called as well. We only trust people who say exactly what we're thinking and feeling. And we uh, don't trust the other side. And uh, I have no idea how long uh, this will be the, the case. But at the moment, that that's what we're involved in. And that's why I think you have the, uh, the polarization. And the part of the world that I spend most of my time in, which is uh, Manitoba, it's very, very hard for people in Manitoba, many people in Manitoba, to understand that uh, Justin Trudeau uh, is a winning prime minister, is a rock star, is a person who still has an excellent chance of winning because they have certain feelings about Justin Trudeau. I could take you to parts of the uh, so-called 905 or the suburbs of Vancouver, or many parts of Quebec and Atlantic Canada, and uh, they don't understand how anyone can even think that Pierre Polyev can be the next prime minister. When people make those observations and conclusions, 99% of the time, it is absolutely sincere. It's based on the circle of people that they're in. If, if, if all of your friends, if all your family are all on one side, it's very, very difficult to understand that there is another side. It may be in the next county. It may be a, a couple of provinces over. But there was once upon a time, I guess, media, a mainstream media that had the ability to bind people. And so it didn't matter what part of the country people lived in. They trusted what they heard and what they saw in media to make them understand why things were the way they were. Well, that's changed. Uh, mainstream media may, may still be called mainstream media, but it's got a competitor. 
uh, one of its competitors is what you and I are doing right now. I want to talk. I have you, boy. You 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 teed me up a question that I so badly want to ask, but I'm going to save it for a little bit later because I do want to talk about the media, the media piece, and and. There's, there's sort of two branches to the conversation I'm hoping that we can have. The first one is, how do you see that, the, that media has changed? And when I'm talking about that, what I'm referring to is what you kind of spoke about there a little bit. When I was, when I was growing up in, in northern Alberta, where we had an antenna wired to the roof of the house because it was the only way to get any kind of a signal on anything, um, the... The programming that you tend to saw, especially when it came to news and commentary, was conducted with a, I'm going to use the word dignified, um, and was because of that well-respected way. It seems like we've, in many ways, drifted from that. I want to know, as, as somebody who's been inside of the, the media apparatus for his entire career, am I reading that wrong? And if I'm not, why do you think that's happened? Well, there was this idea, we hear this all the time, authenticity. And uh, so uh, you had a, a situation where you had relatively attractive people with relatively attractive voices, you know, reading the six o'clock news. And uh, then th th that changed. Um, you know, you had all kinds of people reading the the six o'clock news, whether it was on TV or radio, and some of them sounded like broadcasters. I mean, I, I know that I sound to a lot of people like it, like a throwback. I sound the way people did on the radio when I was a kid. Okay, <laughs> it's not that I I turned my voice into this. I was just uh, fortunate. Uh, you know, DNA gifted me with a voice, and and just listening to the pros gifted me with with what I'll call a, a, a delivery, a style of speaking. Well, so much of that has disappeared now. And so you've got uh, people on radio and on television who just look like ordinary people. There's nothing wrong with them. But what's wrong is the people who are consuming this don't look up to them. They're just like us. You know, there's this uh, expression that you hear all the time in, in political commentary. I want to vote for someone that uh, I can have a beer with. You know what? I don't. I, I don't. I don't. I don't care if I get to have a beer with the premier of Alberta, the prime minister of Canada. None of that matters to me. I would want people who are eminently qualified. I want to vote for someone who knows much more about everything than I do. Does that make the people I support members of the elite? I guess. You know, it, it doesn't. You know, it, 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 I, I I have no trouble with a dry cycle. And McDavid uh, being the two best people uh, to play hockey available to the Edmonton Oilers. I mean, Connor McDavid is from Ontario. He's from Richmond Hill, a place which I love because I got to be a country DJ there. <laughs> so he's from Richmond Hill. I'm just north of Toronto. And Dreisaitl is from Germany. No, no, nobody complains because people who support hockey want the best, no matter what part of the world they come from. And I'm one of those people. I don't care where you come from. But, but, and there's always a big fat but in every conversation. While we love the idea of having elite hockey players uh, playing for the team we support, for some reason we decide that we don't need elite leaders involved in provincial or federal politics. Uh, we just want people who are just like us, just like our neighbors. Nothing wrong with our neighbors. But if I, have need for heart surgery or brain surgery or a great hockey team, I'm not going to turn to my neighbors. I'm going to turn to whoever I can access who is the best. For some reason, in politics, we don't do that. In many cases now, in media, we don't do that. And so you've got the death of the elites, and the death of the elites has dumbed down the political system and the media system and the decline in both media and politics is affecting us because whether people like to hear this or not, I just tell the truth as I see it. We need people to look up to. And when you don't look up to people who are actually running your government or running your information networks, in other words, when we aren't looking up to the people we need to trust, trust erodes. And the erosion of public trust is at the core of everything we're talking about. If you're a fanatic, if you're a cult leader, 
if you're a, a right wing nut job or a left wing nut job, there's nothing more there's not, not, nothing more appetizing for you than having a market, having a society where trust in institutions has eroded because that's the vacuum that you can you can move into. How much of that do you think has to do? I mean, one of the one of the things that I've been sort of toying with an idea is back in the 90s, uh, I was I was a musician. And I remember if you wanted to do a any kind of recording of any kind of song, it required a lot. You couldn't just like go into your basement and go into a, a tape recorder um, and hope for the best. If you wanted to have a professional recording, you had to go to a professional recording studio. That meant connections, that meant money. And then the internet came along and now anybody can record uh, an album with a laptop and $100 worth of audio interface. Do you think that the 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 rise in accessibility is part of what has driven all of this because it seems to me that there's two pieces one of it is the rise of accessibility the other one is the there are people there are organizations ostensibly they call themselves news organizations i would take umbrage with that myself but uh who have realized that you can very easily at a low cost, weaponize people's fear and anxiety to make a lot of money. Well, you know, news organization, if if the news organization is a, a local newspaper or a local radio station or a local TV station, but hardly anybody works there, and all they're doing is regurgitating press releases from the government and uh, the opposition. I mean, they're not investigating any stories. They're not helping the folks. I mean, that, that to me is what a newsroom ought to be about, whether it's a national, local, whether it's a newspaper, radio station. The, the, the idea to me of, of, of news gathering is to go into your community, your country, whatever it is, whatever your jurisdiction is, and, and, and figure out what it is that, that people need. Because when, when, when you're in a society, uh, you know, you're, you're always going to be running into situations where people aren't getting the proper amount of services. Uh, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about public safety or, or public health care. You've got the public out there uh, with anomalies. You've also got, you know, situations we're dealing, you know, with, you know, drug addiction. There are a whole bunch of, of stories that affect real people. And so the idea is to go into those communities and figure out what the anomalies are. Obviously, if 99% of people are crossing the road and they get from one side to the other, that's not a news story. But if there's some issue revolving around traffic, revolving around drugs, revolving around anything that is uh, creating accidents, creating homicides, creating addiction, uh, creating chaos of, of any kind, and I'm just being very vague here for a reason, you cannot actually take a media service seriously when there is literally nobody going out into the community where you just have a handful of people who are at their computers all day and that is their that is their view of society they're not viewing their society they're not viewing their community they're viewing their their computer i mean so it gets to a point and this is not even i'm not even including the artificial intelligence piece you, you'll you have a situation right now where people are covering communities from communities they don't even live in because it doesn't matter. So let's say I'm in Winnipeg right now, and let's say my job is to read a Calgary or Edmonton or Red Deer newscast. You can send me the script. I can access uh, the script. I can access the, the news releases, whatever it is. It doesn't, doesn't matter. What difference does it make if, if my ass is in Red Deer or in Altona, Manitoba? I can still deliver if that's all that's required of local news is just, you know, reading releases, what differences make? But the question always becomes the same question. This is what I always go back to. Am I of service to somebody at that point? Am I of service to the market? Well, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, so you've got uh, news organizations that don't cover any news. I mean, uh, you know, you get you get TV newscasts that you know have stories on about you know whatever the you know the the local fire, uh, you know local local accidents, all the all the stuff that requires 
you know, no, no, no serious investigation at all. I mean, it doesn't matter. We've, we've got visuals. We've got visuals, uh, and we'll we'll speak to the visuals. But all of the stuff that you talk about in your podcast, all of the stuff that becomes issue-oriented content, that does not get covered by most of the so-called mainstream organizations. They don't have the money. Uh, so it's not happening. So once again, there's a vacuum. When there's a vacuum, others will step into the vacuum. But for media organizations to say, we don't understand why the public doesn't uh, stay loyal to us. We don't understand why they don't listen to us as much as they did or, uh, you know, view our shows or, or, or even trust us. When they say that, I often ask myself the question, are you fucking kidding me? You, you used to have a newsroom of 25 people. Now you've got one who's 19 years old and can barely speak English. And you don't understand why people's faith in you, why their why their trust in you has declined? Are you effing kidding me? Uh, and and I'm not, you know, here here it is. I'm a relatively moderate person, and I'm sure to some people watching this, they go, "Oh my God, this guy is this guy's really radical." Are you kidding me? I'm not I'm not radical at all. You know, I I I want the store to have its shelves stocked. I want newsrooms to have their newsrooms stocked. And by the way, when people say, well, the last thing you want is, is government support, why wouldn't I want media to have government support? If the business model doesn't work, if they cannot generate enough funds from advertising to stock the newsroom, what's wrong with the idea of communities having access to information? They need access to information just like they need access to a fire service. Is there something wrong with the government supporting the fire service? I sure hope not. I sure hope we don't get to a point where the you're on your own ideology takes place. And so in certain neighborhoods, if people just can't afford uh, to have a fire station, I guess they just won't have one. I guess they'll just burn down occasionally and, hey, they're on their own because that's how we can be a free society. That, that's how you, you, you measure freedom. Well, I don't measure freedom by putting people out there on their own. That's not that's not freedom for me. But as far as the media piece is concerned, we have to have a serious conversation about whether or not the media is providing adequate information. I think that the lack of information out there, the lack of investigation of, of, of what's really going on in this country, I think it creates a certain level of chaos. It, cert it creates certainly a, a certain level of anxiety. And for, as I say, for the executives of, of, of media companies uh, to just simply throw their hands up and say, I, I really, I really, I really don't know what's happening here. If they don't know what's happening, uh, they shouldn't be in those chairs. It's, it's fascinating. I, boy, the, as you're speaking there, the only thing that I can think of is there was a recent ser series that was done in a local Calgary, uh, and I would for sure call them journalism, uh, called The Sprawl, where they talked about the history of the Calgary Herald and how the Calgary Herald was for a period of time headquartered in downtown Calgary. And then the building was moved to a large building just off of Memorial Trail. I remember going to that building when I was a kid and it felt like a cathedral. It was so busy. There were so many people who were doing so many things and I was just in absolute awe of it. And it's now going to be turned into a, uh, a, a storage facility. I wish I was making that up, but that's that's what the, the big Calgary Herald National Post building is being turned into. It's being turned into a, a U store. I think it's a U-Haul storage facility. And that to me, just aligns with what you said alarmingly well um well it is, it is amazing that you know a big city like calgary uh, edmonton you know it doesn't matter it could be montreal uh, you know i guess Mon montreal was one of the first actual newsrooms uh, that, that i worked in and if you go to that uh, station's newsroom today uh, you won't see more than one or two people there most of the day and you can go for several hours without seeing anybody in there and the same goes for the uh, Toronto newsroom I worked out of and, and, and many others. And so, I mean, it, it, this is a, you know, a simple math issue. If, if, if nobody is in charge of harvesting information and doing stories, if, if the lights are on, but no one's home, how on earth 
Is that a service? We always have to focus on that word. How is that a service to the community? I'm curious. I mean, you've talked about mentorship. You've talked about service to the community. And, and one of the things that I think aligns with that is the whole idea of sort of journalistic standards and practices. And you also mentioned in the absence of a thing, the, the void will be filled. Nature abhors a vacuum and all of that. Do you think that part of the reason why we're seeing so much, um, I, I don't even know what the word would be, I'll go with uh, chaos in the, the media realm, is because the void is being filled, but it's being filled by people who haven't had the, the mentorship that you've been talking about. They haven't had the opportunity to have those skill sets and those values passed on. So they're just kind of making shit up as they go. Do you think that's part of the problem? Well, sure. I mean, you've got in many cases, you've got uh, young people and they're very intimidated. L look at the, the Danielle Smith situation right now where she's uh, holding news conferences without answering follow-up questions. You know, where where is it? Where is there a dean of journalism? Where is there a, a grown-up to look her in the eye and instead of asking a question related to whatever campaign issue that she wants to be on, where is the senior journalist to ask this question? Who the hell do you think you are? I mean, you know, if, if you're if you're not a leader in a democracy and you're not willing to answer questions, if you're not willing to answer follow-up questions, that means you're suppressing a conversation that needs to happen. Who the hell do you think you are? There is no liberal democracy anywhere in the world where when a leader is asking uh, answering questions, they don't answer follow-up questions. The, the president of the United States doesn't do that. I can I can take you to authoritarianism. Vladimir Putin doesn't do that. Now, if you ask the wrong follow-up question, you may fall out of a window. And I'm not trying to be funny, because that's actually true. And I'm not suggesting that we want people to be thrown out of windows here for answering the wrong follow-up question. That's not where this conversation goes at all. But who the hell are you, Premier Smith, to impose this kind of rule? And and why should we respect your rule? And, and and frankly, if, if I were somebody, you know, in, involved in, in media there, uh, I would boycott her news conferences. I would I would boycott the news conference of any, I'm using the word liberal here, small L liberal, small D democracy. I'd boycott the leader of any liberal democracy in any province of this country or federal leader of this country. So whether it's the prime minister or premier, I, I would have media boycotting a leader who says, I'm going to invite you to the news conference. You can ask questions, but you cannot ask follow-up questions. That is the strangest bird I have ever seen. And it just blows my mind that people just trundle into those news conferences and play her game. Being being the premier doesn't mean being own it doesn't mean that you're the owner of the country. You know, Donald Trump does stuff like that all the time. You know, it's my Justice Department. It's my army. You know, those media people do not do not belong to Danielle Smith. Alberta does not belong to Danielle Smith. Democracy does not belong to her. She serves democracy. She serves the people. Now, I realize some people watching or listening to this go, well, it sounds like, a, sounds like Adler's a socialist. I'm sorry, it's got nothing to do with, with socialism. It's got to do with with public service. I mean, how would you feel if you got to see your doctor, even if you only get to see the doctor for 15 minutes? How would you feel if the doctor said, you can ask me one question, I'll answer, but no, no follow-ups? You'd say to yourself, this isn't a doctor, this is a witch doctor. And I, I would say that when, when a, a leader in a liberal democracy, in this case, Alberta, uh, says you can ask a question, but not a follow-up question, I'm just thinking, this isn't a leader. This isn't a leader of anything because there's no morality to that. And when you have no moral authority, it's over. You bring us into Alberta, you bring us into the, the, the realm of my, my last topic. You have for many, many years, uh, I guess, self-identified as a, a conservative. And I was having a conversation with my wife last night about this conversation today. And I said I was going to use this metaphor. I want to know whether or not I'm, I'm on uh, any kind of right track. 
it seems to me that conservatism in a lot of ways in Alberta, especially, is kind of like Coke. There's this expectation of uh, what conservatism is that, you know, this is what it's supposed to be. This is what it's supposed to look like. This is what it's supposed to taste like. I, I've had this for 99 years. Therefore, um, this is this is what Coke is. And it seems to me, especially in the last couple of years, I would I would say the last four years um, that what's kind of happened with conservatism in Alberta, and it seems to perhaps be spreading, is the the brand of conservatism, as I equated to, to Coke, has gone, you know what, we've done Coke this way for 99 years. We're going to introduce something. It's called New Coke. Let's see what you think of it. And it you know, I was I was actually reading up on my history of New Coke last night to see how far I could carry this metaphor. And initially, it was adopted quite well. But after a short period of time, people went, oh, I don't like this. And there was quite a bit of, of pushback. Do you think that conservatism, as it's operating in Alberta, is not the same thing as the original brand of conservatism? And do you think that there will be a possibility of people saying, well, I don't like that flavor. That's not what I thought it was. What'll it take? You know, I, I was at home in conservatism for, for decades, uh, you know, virtually my entire adult life. Um, I was a, a, you know, call it a, a Peter Lougheed conservative, a Bill Davis conservative. That's that that's the conservatism that, that appealed to me. So if I compare Peter Lougheed to Danielle Smith, uh, you know, it's it's new Coke compared to sewer Coke. Uh, you know, I, I I prefer Coke to sewage. And they, if you want to put sewage in in a bottle and, and call it Coke, I mean, I don't care what you call it. I mean, that's that's that there's. I mean, can you imagine Peter Lougheed saying, "Well, you, you guys can ask a question, but don't ask don't ask a follow up question. Don't." Don't engage my answer. I'll just say whatever the hell I want, and don't, don't, don't you dare engage. So no, I mean this isn't this isn't conservatism. I don't really have a name for it. I think sewage will do. Dirt. Um, it uh, dirties uh, up democracy. It makes uh, people, especially young people who haven't uh, you know seen the better Coke. Uh, it makes them think that this is what government is all about. The government isn't really about serving you. The government is just some some political game that some cult uh, likes to play. Um, so, you know, I, I, when, when, when people who favor this new conservatism, when they want to call me names, I don't care what names they want to call me, but you know, when they say, you know, you, you, you're not, you're not part of us, you're not with us. I sure as, I sure as hell I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm proud not to be a Danielle Smith uh, conservative. Uh, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd want to get my head examined if I were. And this is the question that I wanted to ask you earlier, but I, 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 I held my tongue. You talked about empathy and you talked about um, recognizing the humanity in people and, and, and seeing how people become radicalized. Do you think that Danielle Smith was lonely? I think a part of her had to be. Uh, I think a part of her had to be very, very isolated. I really believe in, in my heart of hearts that uh, Danielle Smith, had things gone differently, would have been happy to be a, a progressive conservative. As a matter of fact, when she she crossed the floor to be a, a progressive uh, conservative for, for a while, I think uh, she actually looked happier than I'd seen her in a while. I think she, she felt at home. She was massively rejected, must have felt massively rejected by what went on after that. And I do believe uh, that uh, she spent probably much too much time um, in her sorrows. I'm not going to suggest she drowned her sorrows. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. But I think she got on the Internet like a lot of people who got isolated. And she got a buzz off a lot of this right-wing stuff that's going on. Uh, in the United States that's uh, spreading here. I mean, the other day, uh, she was, I guess, in Gibbons, but this is not, uh, you know, her old radio days. This is recent stuff. And she started on on some riff about how Alberta should do its own trade deals with certain states. She, she called them the free states, the red states. She called it the free states. And I'm thinking, holy cow, 
she's got to be still inhaling. She's got to be inhaling all this American right wing sewage because, you know, the, 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 the far right in the States want to believe that the red States like, like the Floridas and the South Dakotas that Danielle Smith admires because they were fairly anti-vax or very, very lax with, with mask mandates and vax mandates and what have you, that they were the, the free states, much like in the Civil War, the free states were where the slaves weren't slaves. Black people were free. That doesn't mean they were treated particularly well, but I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. They weren't slaves. So you had the pre-Civil War, you had the slave states and the free states. And now Danielle Smith, just like a lot of American right-wingers, is using this expression, the Republican states, states that are dominated by Republicans are the free states, and the other states, I guess, presumably, aren't free. They won't use the word slave, uh, but I guess they think of the blue states as, let's just say, less than free. And I'm thinking, what the heck is going on in the mind of the premier of of Alberta? Uh, She's got this distorted view of what's going on in the states. Uh, She's got a totally distorted view of what's going on here. Uh, she doesn't want to take follow-up questions. So when you ask the question, was she lonely? I don't know if she was like physically lonely, but psychologically, uh, she had to become rather isolated from Canada and from mainstream Alberta to be inhaling all this sour gas. I got two more questions for you, and then I'm going to let you go because you promised me an hour and I've already blown way past that. Uh <laughs> So I appreciate your, your your generosity. I'll go for it, just, just so we're clear. Uh, these are important uh, things we're talking about, and uh, you take as much time as you need. No, thank you, sir. Um, what would you, I mean, as somebody who has for years identified as a conservative, what would you say to people who identify with the original brand of Coke or, cons- or conservatism that you identified with who are looking at the upcoming election in Alberta? Um, I don't know if you want to say vote this way, yes or no, but what are the things that you want people thinking about as they're looking at the the ballot coming up on November or May 29th? Well, I, I endorsed uh, Rachel Notley as first time ever. I've endorsed uh, an NDP uh, for premier, federal, provincial, whatever. I mean, I, I've never, I've never endorsed the NDP. I still didn't, in, in my mind, endorse the NDP. I endorsed Rachel, Rachel Notley uh, because uh, to me, it's it's a choice and it's very binary. You know, at the end of the trail, either it's Danielle Smith or Rachel Notley. And as a person who still identifies, yeah, I'm a moderate conservative, small C conservative, fiscal conservative, social tolerant, moderate, liberal, whatever you want to call me. I, you know, I, I just don't believe that uh, people's uh, the private lives or any of my business, uh, uh, abortion, uh, same sex marriage, whatever, not, not, not my business. So I'm, I'm in that sense, a very traditional um, progressive conservative. Okay. So I believe that the only way that the progressive conservative way has a chance is if um, sewer Coke gets out of the way. So sewer Coke has to be put in the penalty box. And the only way to put them in the penalty box is to vote for Rachel Notley's team. And I, I realize that that sounds crazy to some conservatives. Are you suggesting that we vote for the socialists? Well, you know, um, I, I would take. I would take a person who's uh, a little to the left of me, maybe maybe a lot to the left of me, who is a stable person. I'm not even asking for much anymore. Uh, I think Rachel Notley uh, is is stable. I don't think that she's chaotic. I, I don't think that she wants to burn business down. I think similar to small C conservatives, she understands and believes that you have to have a strong private sector to be able to support all these social programs. I mean, why am I, why am I, why am I a small C conservative? I'm not a small C conservative because I ran away to some cult. I'm a small C conservative because you know the, the, the let's call it red Tories, Peter Lawhead conservatives. What, what I what I grew up with was, it's the best possible path to allow the private sector to have the most amount of opportunity to throw off the most amount of revenue for the best possible social services whether it's the fire department or, or the hospital. Now, that's why I'm a small C conservative. I'm not a small C conservative because I want to make sure that, you know, uh, George becomes a billionaire. I could care less if anybody becomes a, a billionaire. 
I want I want as as much of the middle class as possible, but I want those social services to be in wonderful shape. And yes, that includes media because I'm against chaos. I'm against chaos because it's chaos that creates fertilizer for authoritarianism, which takes us back to the very beginning of my life. I don't even know what the odds were against the idea of someone of me being born. You had death warrants signed for both of my parents, and somehow they managed to survive. And because they survived, that's why I was born. Now, they came from totally different parts of the country, in many ways, different cultures. Had the Holocaust not happened, they never, ever would have met. I mean, the the the, the chances of my own existence if you ran it, uh, you know, on, on some computer program uh, out of, you know, some genius's head in Edmonton or, or Calgary, I'm sure that it's not even one, there's not even a one in a billion chance that someone like me is even born. So I'm not going to piss away my life when the odds against me even being alive were astronomically high. I'm going to piss away my life running away to some sort of cult and uh, just saying to myself, whole hum. It doesn't matter what's happening to my province. It doesn't matter what's happening to my country. I'm doing okay. So you guys are just on your own. Because if I had that attitude, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation. I mean, it's, 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 sure, there are many other things that I could do with my day. But I think it's important to have this conversation because we're talking about the most important topic in Canada. And the most important topic on Canada, whether it's Alberta or any other province, is real freedom, not freedom real freedom for the people who are watching and listening to this right now. The number one freedom in a liberal democracy is freedom from fear. And you can't guarantee, you can't guarantee that you will have nothing in your society to be scared of, but you sure as hell can do whatever is possible to create as much of a sophisticated, organized, civilized society where the intelligent people aren't smeared for being elites where the intelligent people are being thanked for the knowledge that they have and integrated into society so they could bring their knowledge. It doesn't matter whether it's technical, educational, medical, scientific, it doesn't matter. Let's integrate intelligent people into society to make sure that all of us become as educated as possible, but most important for all of us to be safe. It always goes back to safety with me. That's why I'm a small c conservative. It is not to make Elmer a billionaire. It is to make sure as many of us are as safe as possible from those people who would do severe damage to us. In regards to people who would do severe damage to us, there's been a lot of rhetoric. There's been a lot of language that's been used. And I want to ask this question, and I want to be clear that I'm coming from a place of... Uh, <laughs> I'll say nervousness and respect. Um, but people are looking at some of the things that Danielle Smith are, is doing, some of the things that she's proposing, and they're saying that we're going down a road that historically has ended up in some very dark places. Do you see any of those things? Is that hyperbole? Is that people blowing things out of proportion? Um, or is this something that, as a province, Alberta should be paying very close attention to and making sure that we have, in fact, learned from history? Well, I'm not I'm not worried that, uh, you know, that uh, she's going to be setting up concentration camps. I mean, I just want to be very, very clear on, on that. Uh, a yeah. lot of a lot of horrible things have to happen. A lot of safeguards have to leave. The, the good fortune we have, that despite her rhetoric about Ottawa this and Ottawa that, because this has absolutely nothing to do with, with, with Justin Trudeau and how people may feel about him and uh, the Liberal Party and the NDP and all of that. Um, fortunately, uh, Alberta is a part of Canada. So fortunately, her power to do damage is severely limited. Uh, for for those, those people who don't understand how valuable it is for Alberta not to be on its own, not to be a sovereign country. The Danielle Smith era, which I'm hoping will come to an end in just a few weeks, but the Danielle Smith era is the best possible example of why it's important for Alberta to be inside Canada. 
people who are watching this, listening, they have been paying a lot of attention. I would just want to ask you and, and, and your audience this question. If you think Danielle Smith is doing damage as the premier of Alberta to Albertans, if you think Danielle Smith is making Albertans feel unsafe, can you imagine if a premier Smith is doing this? Can you imagine how scary it would be to be an Albertan and have an Alberta family if premier Smith were president Smith of the, the sovereign Republic of Alberta? Can you imagine? the damage that she would happily do. In her mind, it wouldn't be damage, of course. In her mind, it would be something akin to perfection. She would she would create the perfect society. But her, her idea of perfection uh, is completely out of sync with the attitudes of the overwhelming majority of people in Alberta. So if I am in Alberta right now, and that's where my, my heart is right now, I am thanking God for Canada. It's not about Trudeau. It's not about the Liberals and the NDP and whatever it is that they're doing. It's just the, the confederation that I'm, in, I'm a part of. There are so many safeguards preventing someone like Danielle Smith from going all the way. Thank God for Canada. I couldn't agree with you more, sir. And I... Uh... I, got, I have two kids of my own, so if, if it was President Smith, I, boy, I, uh, I'd be out pretty quick, too. I think. <laughs> I'm, I'm born and raised in this province, and I absolutely love Alberta, but that, that scenario, and in the first place my head went was like, I got to get my kids safe. Um, be, but I think that speaks to the, the value that that, ironically, Canadian firewall uh, protects Alberta with. My last thing that I wanted to ask you about is, I mean, A, I wanted to ask you about it, and B, I wanted to say some other things. I'll ask you the question first, though. Um, the last provincial election, in the run-up to the last provincial election, you did an interview, sir, that was, I think, probably one of the most listened to, most discussed interviews um, that I can remember, certainly in recent Canadian history. You have to know which one I'm talking about. Uh, you had a conversation with uh, Mr. Jason Kenney. Um, for anybody who hasn't, I, it's impossible for me to imagine, but for anybody who hasn't heard that conversation, I would strongly encourage everybody to go listen to it because it is one of the most powerful pieces of radio that I think I've ever heard, to be honest. And I'm, I'm not just blowing smoke. That was a masterclass, sir. Um, what did you feel after that conversation happened? Well, what happened was uh, Jason Kenney uh, was, you know, avoiding uh, certain questions. And uh, he was taking follow-up questions. Uh, he was taking them, so I was giving them. Uh, and uh, it started out with, the business about uh, a person who was destined to become his education minister. There was no doubt in, in my mind or anybody's because as far as I was concerned, the outcome of that election had been decided a year earlier. Uh, Albertans were going to vote for, for the UCP. And uh, just to put all my cards on the table, I was a supporter of the UCP happening. I was a supporter of, of Jason Kenney. It all fell apart that night. Um, so there's a, an MLA uh, who had said some uh, very, very crazy things while doing a, a sermon in a church a few years earlier. And he said some crazy things about uh, women, said some crazy things about gay men. He was doing a lot of far right wing crazy talk. And so I was just asking Mr. Kenny after he was able to listen to some of that sermon. I was asking him what what he thought of it, what he what he thought of this human being, and whether uh, he might consider uh, telling the the people of that uh, constituency in Alberta, not terribly far from Edmonton, uh, that you know you want to vote for him, that's democracy, vote for him, but this person won't sit in my caucus. This person's out of sync with UCP values, Alberta values, and and my values, my values as in Jason Kenney. To me, a very, very simple statement to make. And then it all fell apart. He, he, he wouldn't he wouldn't do that. And they started BSing about how the 
gay community embraces much of what this person says and what this person uh, believes. It's just, and then at some point, I just, I couldn't take all the, um, the BS that was coming at me. I felt personally uh, insulted because Jason Kenny and I are friends. Uh, and he was treating me like a rube, which I don't like uh, the way Daniel Smith treats the media, frankly. Um, so I remember going, uh, you know, you know, knock, knock, uh, you know, who is, who is this person? Who's there? What, what happened to my friend, uh, Jason Kenny? Who are you? Uh, and, uh, he still wanted to spin. So, uh, he said that uh, some of the questions were out of line and I said, Mr. Kenny, you know, every, every leadership issue, every time you're up for an election, you know, it's it, character is what's most important. You know, I can't remember exactly what I said, but it was essentially, you know, you're you're failing the character test. I want to give you a chance to uh, to pass the character test. So I finally went to a place where I guess he didn't expect me to go and Albertans didn't expect me to go, but I wanted him to pass the character test. So I brought up San Francisco where he was practicing serious homophobia to the point where he was wanting uh, to have rules in place which would prevent gay men literally dying in hospices from getting visits from their partners. Rules that would actually prevent their partners from attending the funerals of their gay partners. That's the kind of stuff that Jason Kenney was into. And I wanted him to give a, I wanted him to pass the character test because we're days away from an election, and I want to believe that the person who's about to become the CEO of the government of Alberta has a sliver of character, just something. Um, and so I thought this was going to be re- very easy. I just asked him to apologize, to apologize for, for what he had done, to apologize to the, to the families of, of those men. He wouldn't do it. Um, he just did one of these, well, that was then, and and this is now, and, you know, basically one of those answers that uh, essentially boils down to, like, shit happens. Why are you bothering me about this? And I, I, I just, knowing how deep Kenny was into philosophy and theology and morality, I just thought to myself, my God, th- this is the real Kenny. I, I've got a Wizard of Oz situation here. You know, I've got I've got one attitude going into this interview about who this person is, and now I'm forced to look at what's behind the curtain. And behind the curtain is a moral empty, a moral numpty, a moral sewer. And I felt personally um, assaulted, let down, betrayed. And at some point, I guess we were talking about uh, the various people that were attracted to uh, his party. And here's a situation where the United Conservative Party, I mean, uh, getting the lion's share of conservatives, you don't have to go for the for the people on the extreme margins. You don't have to go for the extremists, the people that Kenny thinks of as knuckle draggers. It's a term that he uses in the real world. So I used the term. I just said, uh, you know, I, w- I was going through all these different bozo eruptions that he'd had uh, along the campaign trail. And I, and, I, and I just said, you know, why why are these uh, what what is it that you're doing or what is it that your your party's doing to attract all these knuckle draggers? And uh, he tried to turn that into me smearing all Albertans, which is ridiculous. I love Alberta. I want to protect Alberta from the knuckle draggers. And I fully expect an educated person like Kenny. I realize he doesn't have a bunch of university degrees, but he's a very educated person. I know that from my my personal experience of him. He's an intelligent man. He's usually the smartest guy in the room. And uh, I just I just said to uh, Jason Kenny, what, what are you doing? What do, what do you mean I'm smearing Albertans? What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Islamophobes and the and the homophobes and, and this this you know collection of rejects, society's rejects that, that you're attracting. Why? Why why do you go for them? Why are you why are you pandering to them? You don't need to do this. You, you, you've got mainstream conservatives. You've got mainstream Albertans. Anyway, uh, in the coming days, uh, his social media people, his digital crew, 
uh, put out the message that Charles Adler has turned on Albertans. Charles Adler thinks that Albertans are a bunch of knuckle draggers. And that, I think, brings you up to speed with with what happened about uh, four years ago. Um, I wasn't looking forward to having that conversation at all. And I wasn't looking forward to discovering what I discovered that night about my old friend, Jason Kenney. I, I lost a friend uh, that night. And there's nothing about it that makes me happy. I don't imagine so. Have you spoken to him since, if you don't mind my asking? No. No, I haven't. Okay. Uh, there's, uh, the bridge... The bridge has uh, unfortunately uh, been burned, and he still hasn't apologized no. uh, for what he was instrumental in in San Francisco. And I will go to my grave, not understanding how someone I trusted and uh, respected um, could do that. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not the, I may not be the smartest guy in the room, but I'm not the dumbest either. And I, I just, I, I, I don't, I don't understand that there's a, there's a, there's a piece there that I'm just not, uh, it's, it's above my pay grade to, uh, to understand how someone can do that in the first place. And upon reflection decades later, still not be able to say, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry for what I did. I was completely wrong i was morally wrong and jason kenny has never had trouble uh saying that other people were morally wrong i, I don't know why on this particular file uh he can't say i was morally wrong because he was well, for what it's worth as somebody who's been on the receiving end of that same uh digital hit squad <laughs> um i can tell you and i, I obviously i can only speak for myself but I did not in any way interpret that conversation as you betraying Alberta or, or betraying conservatism. In fact, if, if anything, um, it was the complete opposite. And while I totally recognize that there was a, a personal loss that was involved for you there, um, I am nonetheless grateful that you had the ability and the will to have that difficult conversation um, because it revealed some things that I think that people needed to see. Um, and it is exactly the, the, the type of conversation that I think real journalists and real media need to be having way more of. Because as you alluded to earlier, the deferential tone that too many people take to politicians and allow the politicians to make the rules in regards to the follow-up questions takes us down a road that isn't good. So, well, I hope that, uh, hope that someone has access to uh, Danielle Smith at some point to do a, a real interview with her, uh, drilling down on why she says the, the things she says and not allowing her to get away with things like, well, uh, this was imprecise and that that's imprecise. Uh, you know, that's just not, not on, uh, no follow-up questions that, that that's not on. I think anybody uh, who's, who's paying attention uh, to what she's doing and how she's doing it, ought to ask themselves some serious questions about character and questions about leadership and not end up in the, well, at least she's not a socialist. I think that is the the biggest uh, cop-out in the world. Uh, the other day I was listening to Jared Wesley, and I guess some people might be surprised that Jared Wesley has only had uh, two. There's a political scientist at the University of Alberta, very, very articulate person most people watching and listening uh, to these podcasts uh, are all over Twitter and so it's very easy to find Dr. Jared Wesley and so most people because he's been so critical of, of Danielle Smith and the UCP jump to the conclusion that oh he must be an NDP -er. and so Jared Wesley on Ryan Jesperson's podcast on Real Talk you know said there's only two membership cards that he's ever had one is uh, Alberta PC and the other is is UCP. And so people have got to understand that the antipathy to Danielle Smith is not a socialist thing or an NDP thing. It's a liberal democracy thing. It's a Canadian thing. It's an Alberta thing. Everything she says is completely out of sync with how Albertans think of themselves. Um, 
you know, uh, Gordon Lightfoot, Gordon Lightfoot, my friend, uh, you know, has passed. And I, in the last 24 hours, I've, I've looked at that lyric, Alberta Bound, you know, over and over and over again. I know what it, it has meant to me and and so many people, whether they're living in Alberta or not. And when I look at the expression of of, of that feeling that Gordon does better than anybody else, and I'm glad that Paul Brandt uh, covered that tune. Uh, most of Gordon's tunes have been covered by, by by really, really good people. Paul Brandt is one of them. He covered that particular song. If you if you listen to the spirit of that song, it is as opposed to what Danielle Smith says and does. It is as opposed to what Take Back Alberta is about. I mean, it just it just is. So, I mean, I'm just hoping that in the next few weeks, uh, for people who feel they cannot vote for Rachel Notley because she's NDP, I hope they vote for someone else, a vote for the Alberta Party, the Liberal Party, whatever else is on the ballot, or frankly, stay home. Uh, because if you feel that you absolutely have to vote for Danielle Smith because her party has the word conservative in it, please don't insult yourself. North Korea is called the Democratic Republic of Korea. It really is. The Democratic North North Korea, which is a concentration camp. It's all it is. It's, it's the most horrific concentration camp that exists in, in 2023. That the, the entire country is a concentration camp. And it's called the Democratic Republic of Korea. Words mean things. And when someone who is as authoritarian as possible is talking about freedom, 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 be suspicious of that. And when you know in your heart growing up with conservatism, growing up primarily with progressive conservatism, if you know in your heart that Danielle Smith and Peter Lougheed are on two different planets, Danielle Smith and Ralph Klein are on two different planets. If you know that, Danielle Smith and Jim Prentice, the late Jim Prentice, two different planets, if you know that, I would humbly ask you not to give her points because the word conservative is in her party's title. Mr. Adler, this has been an absolute gift. Um, I cannot thank you enough for for taking the time to have this conversation. Um, it is, yeah, I just, I, I am... I am so grateful. I have literally two pages of notes that I've been making as we've been going, um, because you've 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 said so much insightful and important things. So, I just want to say a, a tremendous thank you from from me, from everybody at the show, uh, and on I'm going to say on behalf of our audience for sitting down to have this this very long form conversation. Um, I I really really do. I just can't say thank you enough, sir. Well, thank you for giving me an opportunity to, to talk to the people I love. Thank you for asking follow-up questions. Uh, thank you for, for loving this uh, democracy. And uh, God bless Alberta. As always, if you appreciate the kind of content that we're trying to produce here at The Breakdown, we would love it if you swung by our Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash thebreakdownab and signed up for a small monthly sponsorship of the work that we're trying to do here. It is because of the support that we receive from our Patreon sponsors that we're able to continually up our game, and it is tremendously appreciated. So I want to throw a big thank you out to them, and you can go ahead and visit that website and join and support us as well because we need all the help we can get. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for listening and being a part of these important conversations. And we will see you next time on The Breakdown.